to the start of Brian. How many UConn newcomers do we have here? Okay, great, awesome. So what Startup Grind is, is that we are a uh, organization for founders, by founders, and uh, basically we started in Mountain View, California, with about nine founders, startup founders, and it has slowly grown in the last three years, actually quickly grown in the last three years to uh, over 60 chapters all over the world. So we've probably serviced about 100,000 uh, startup founders just like yourself uh, all over the world. So we're, we, we're so excited, excited that you guys are here. Um, so our, found, our, our guests tonight, there are actually two of them. Uh, and uh, yeah, this, it's really amazing because we usually do one, but two of them wanted to come out, so we're so excited. Our guests tonight, guests tonight, they are the founders of GroupMe. How many, how many of you have heard GroupMe? Okay, how many of you have not heard of GroupMe? Yeah, you're here for the food. <laughs> so anyways, uh, so GroupMe actually started, it's a, it's a uh, it's a texting platform for groups to what, who want to do live uh, collaboration. And they actually started in TechCrunch Disrupt 2010. And so, uh, you know, and then after, after they won the, the hackathon at uh, TechCrunch, they uh, quickly basically um, raised about $10.6 million um, from Ron Conway to Coastal Ventures. So it, it happened very quickly. And then after that, a year later, they, uh, they got bought out by Skype. So, and then Skype bought them out for about $80 million. And then after that, Microsoft bought Skype out for $8.5 billion. So it's like one little fish getting, big, getting eaten by another fish. So that's what happened. And then, um, uh, so, so Jared, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to say his name before I introduced him. So one of the founders was, uh, uh, he worked at Tumblr. The other one had worked at Guild. So it's gonna be a very interesting story. But before I bring them up, to the stage, um, I want to, we usually do a startup grind cheer. It's a, it's a startup grind, um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, like this tradition that we do. So we ask everyone to rise out their seat, right? And we're gonna do a practice round right now, okay? Just practice round, okay? We're gonna ask you guys to rise out of your seat and let's act like this is 2017, okay? And Jack Dorsey just won the mayorship, okay? So can we do that? So let's do a practice round, ready? Right, so ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jack Dorsey. <laughs> okay, I gotta go on. Yeah. So, so before I, I uh, bring them up, I want you guys to go onto the website startgrind.com, go to click on New York, and then uh, put your email in there. You'll get access to all the events for the whole year, um, uh, future events. And then also we have this thing called uh, New York City Pass, which will, it's a one year membership. You get VIP seating, no VIPs here, but anyways, you get VIP seating. And then uh, every time we have Q&A, &A, you guys are gonna be the first one to, to be picked for Q&A. So it's, and it's also um, half price of the general admission. So it's, uh, you know, 240, uh, 240, $240 you get for $99, $99, so it's a great deal. So, without further ado, <laughs> You guys ready? All right. Please join me in welcoming Jared Heck and Scott Bertosi. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott. How's it going, guys? Good. How are you? Good, good. Uh, we only have one mic. We can uh, talk loud. Sure, sure. No, uh, we'll do this so uh, you can go through the videos. but. Hey, uh, so sorry that we uh, gave you the wrong venue yeah. address. We were there on time. You were there on time. Okay, got it. Um, we didn't so, think anyone was showing up to watch. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, well, um, we're so glad you guys are here, uh, our guests. And um, I just wanted to uh, first start out, like, how did you guys, like, you know, we'll, we'll, we want to first start out on a personal note. So, huh? like, where did you guys grow up, right? Yep. Uh, where did you guys go to school? And uh, how did you guys meet? So you guys, you guys can take some turns here. Cool. Yeah. Can you hear me without the mic? Oh, well, they want it for yeah. video. Oh, you want a mic for video. Yeah. Um, I was born in San Francisco, uh, and then I'd say I'd spent the formative years of my life in uh, New Jersey and New York City. Um, I went to school in New York City at uh, Columbia. Uh, and third question is, where did we meet? So, how did we meet? How did we meet? 
Um, Steve and I met because we, uh, well, we're both music lovers, particularly live music lovers, and we both had um, our own startups and businesses in the music world. Uh, and in particular, we liked two bands. Um, one of them is called the Disco Biscuits, and the other one is called Fish. Um, and they're like jam bands, sort of offspring of the Grateful Dead. Um, and we met at their shows um, because we did a lot of work with those specific bands. Um, so we kind of met over a love of music. Uh, and so I grew up on Long Island and uh, went to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh and then moved back here. Uh, and yeah, met at concerts. Covered that one. Cool. So you went to CMU? Yeah. Guess who else is from CMU with IS major? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, here we go. So love it. There we go. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, so how did you, how did, so I, I, I will get to you with the club here. How did you like CMU, by the way? Uh, I mean, like, I didn't really figure out how to do college work until, Open mic close to your mouth. I didn't figure out how to do college work until my junior year, um, and then I think it was a great place for me to go and uh, just kind of, like, have a good time. I, I honestly, like, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, my, my whole opinion on college right now is I've been telling people to, like, get B's and C's and don't get A's because you're wasting your time. Uh, and that you can use that time to go do your entrepreneurial passions instead of, no one ever asked me what my GPA was after I graduated. As long as I got the school name attached to it and a major, uh, I was fine. Uh, so I, I, you know, so it's funny, I, I, already, I didn't get A's. Um, and I tell people not to and to work on program. I mean, I really learned to program on my own time because you know a lot of people who go to learn the program at school, a lot of it's very fundamental, and you get no education for applying that. Uh, and using that extra time to apply it into an entrepreneurial venture or uh, working on something fun is that's how I recommend to do things. So, <laughs> so uh, Jared, you uh, you went to Columbia, and you and give me correct me if I'm wrong. You were a political science major. Yep. Right, and so. What was sort of your aspirations when you were a freshman? Did you want to get into politics? You want to be a lawyer? I mean, what was what was your thinking when you uh, picked that major? Um, I I uh, no, I did not want to get into politics. I did not want to be a lawyer. Um, I wanted to work in the music industry um, when I was a freshman, and I wanted to manage bands and produce shows and throw festivals and and really think about how a business like that would scale. Um, so I generally agree with Steve. Um, I'm not like I would encourage people to get B's or C's. I'd encourage people to do as well as possible. Um, I'd say like if you want to go into banking or consulting, then get A's because that's how you go into banking or consulting. But if, what's that? I didn't want to do that. That's fair. <laughs> um, but I mean, so if you like, you know, you know when you enter college, that's what you want to do, then you should try and get A's. Um, but otherwise, I think if you have like entrepreneurial tendencies uh, and you know you want to work at a startup or start a startup, your time is better suited to be spent. Uh, learning how to work at those companies, or learning what it takes to start a business, or even just starting a business. Um, so you had five bands in. I heard in past interviews you, you were involved in five different bands. Is that right? No, I mean like playing in like bands. or like you were. You I were, played in some bands and managed a couple bands too. Oh, yeah. Okay, they okay. weren't very good though. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's 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 interesting because like because um, I uh, before I get to the groupie story. Yeah. Um, it's interesting how you guys had met, because uh, it was had nothing to do with technology. And so, you know, I've been I've been to the TechCrunch disrupt disruptathon, and uh, disruptathon <laughs> disrupt uh, the the hackathon. I'm sorry. And so, like it's it was interesting how um, how Steve. I guess you convinced Jared. Uh, I'll, I'll hey, 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 we, we explain. That. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Joe and I met through music, but we kind of became friends and probably closer friends than you know the normal people you meet in uh, you know at these concerts because we did care about startups and we cared about uh, building companies and we would talk about all these things like I, I knew Jared when he was still in college uh, before he decided he was debating whether or not to go to do Teach for America or go be the eighth employee at Tumblr um, and you know like it, I had a startup that I would get his we always wanted to work together um, and you know, so, th so that was the kind of thing. Our, our bond was strengthened in the fact that we both respected each other and wanted to work with each other, and we really enjoyed spending time with each other. You know, like I think there's this amazingly uh, hard to find co-founder dynamic of someone you generally want, genuinely want to spend your time with, and also have the total respect of when it comes to working with them. 
And that just like kind of, uh, you know, gestated for a while before we were able to work with each other because the opportunity wasn't right. Um, and then it was Jared who, uh, you know, had the idea for solving this group text messaging concept so we could go to a concert better with our friends. And I, I pushed to go and say, yeah, let's do it. Let's go to this hackathon and do it. Um, because what we needed to do is find a way to kind of time box the ability to work with each other. We both had good jobs where we were. We were both interested in going to do something on our own, but we couldn't figure out how to go make that happen. And some people will work together on weekends. And, you know, some people will try things, uh, you know, little experiments. But this was the first idea that Jared and I kind of said, let's go. There were, there were many that we would didn't work on together. Yep. But uh, this is the one I was like, let's go try this. Uh, that's kind of how we got to that. So. Yeah, pretty spot on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where we love to hear stories where did this almost didn't happen or you guys were positive you wanted to do this. And did you think this was the this was going to be your breakout event or did you... Yeah. We just wanted to go to this concert, you know. We wanted a chance to work with each other and we wanted to solve a simple problem that would actually be something that we could use. Um, so, you know, um, that's where it just we kind of went down. Yeah, but I, the night we started building it, um, like, you know, we entered, <laughs> we entered the hackathon because I wanted a free ticket to the hackathon and you wanted to win a hackathon. Um, but then around three hours into actually building uh, GroupMe, which we initially called Grouply, uh, we knew that this is what we wanted to do, yeah. um, like immediately. Yeah. We had made plans to quit our job, like three hours into building a we made plans to quit our jobs, tell our bosses, raise money. The next day we were going to raise money the next day. Um, we were completely delusional. Um, and go build this company. Uh, so we actually kind of didn't know what we were going to do. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's a lot different than like 99% of the uh, guys that go out there. Um, but I mean, so you guys were on a mission. You guys were like, okay, we're going to do this, do or die. Sort of well, well, we were gonna we were gonna build it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, as soon as, I think it was as soon as we as soon as we had a working product that worked end to end, we're like, oh well, this needs to go. This needs to be built. You know, like we we could feel like because that was the beauty of it is that the hack that we were able to actually send the group text message uh, within hours of doing the work, and we're like, well, this is gonna make life better. Uh, we gotta go. We gotta do this, and here's how we'll do it. Here's how we'll make money, and here's how we'll, like. And so it's just kind of like, once you felt that product in your hand, you were like, I want to go do this. And, uh, you know, like that was the joy of being able to build something so quickly and feel it. Um, so. So you guys already had the idea in hand and then uh, you got, you used the, the hackathon more, more or less as a, as a platform. Is that a correct assessment? Great. Yeah. It was a kind of a forcing function to actually get it done. Okay, got it, got it. No. And, and, and one note on it, like the hackathon is like, you know, it's just about being able to sit down and focus and like get to that MVP or like get to that milestone you're trying to get to with that idea. And, you know, as an engineer, I, you know, you sit down for 12 hours straight and work on something, you can get pretty far. Um, so, you know, we were able to utilize, it's one of the things that I talk about sometimes about utilizing all the different tools uh, and kind of like building your like Lego blocks as a as an engineer of like how to be able to quickly build something. And uh, the hackathon was just a great way to say, all right, uninterrupted, no, you know, we're doing this for 12 hours and see what we get. And you know, we got we got pretty fun. All right, so Jared, uh, so I, I want to take two steps back here, but can you explain what Groovy is? I mean, I know we're, we we kind of jumped into it, but I, I think there's for the benefit of the audience who don't know what GroupMe is, can you explain it in a very terse way? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so GroupMe is a mobile group messaging application that helps you communicate with and stay in touch with your close ties, whether it's your family, your coworkers, your roommates, your high school buddies, your fantasy football team, you name it. It really just makes life easy. It helps you stay connected to the people that you care about. And, and just to walk through what GroupMe was and where it is now, kind of from a feature standpoint, uh, that very first thing that we were talking about was uh, being able to just send an SMS to a group of people and receive that uh, by giving each group a unique phone number. And we only had the ability to send messages uh, over SMS at first, and it was still an awesome product. Uh, and then we layered on things like an iPhone app, which let you share photos and easily create groups. Then we added in-app messaging. Then we added things like location sharing and, and, and feature groups. And now you can do things on like group, you like split a bill easily with your friends. 
um, and, you know, and so much more, but like it was kind of that foundation of staying together in these groups on mobile, and that's kind of the evolution of the product. Okay. Um, so, so then, uh, so GroupMe uh, basically debuted in, uh, in, in TechCrunch, Disrupt, uh, the Hackathon, and then you guys... Disrupt the phone. Yeah, <laughs> Just, just that. Just that. Um, but uh, then you guys, uh, then you guys did another. I guess, uh, well, it really caught on at South by Southwest, right? Is that is that? So you had it. The 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 uh, you won the the hackathon. So yeah. Um, so that hackathon was in. It was the end of May of 2010. Yeah. We did not win anything. We lost. Um, we lost. We got an honorable mention. We got one. Um, we got an honor roll <laughs> from one of the judges. Um, but we came out with a working prototype, and therefore, in our minds, we won. Um, and we also had a product that we felt we had enough passion about and conviction in um, that we were compelled to leave our jobs and go raise capital so that we could pursue this full time. Okay. Um, and that's what we did. Uh, and we closed a round of financing. We, we left our jobs at the end of June, early July of 2010. So it was around a month that went by, a month and a half. Uh, we closed around financing in August of 2010. And then what we did was we went to TechCrunch Disrupt San Francisco in September of 2010. So there's actually two TechCrunch Disrupts. Okay. One in New York, one in San Francisco. Right, right. And at the one in San Francisco, we actually presented on stage and it was a really nice story because we were able to talk about how we built a set of hackathon in TechCrunch Disrupt, how we actually um, kind of uh, made everything pretty and functional and very workable. Um, and had a public launch um, in between the Disrupt conferences and went up on stage at Disrupt and introduced a new feature where we actually allowed brands uh, to effectively kind of communicate with users and we introduced a platform called Sponsored Groups there. Um, then in December, so this is like very fast time frame, yeah. we're talking like four, five, six month time frame, um, we had a lot of traction uh, and really nice growth and very compelling growth and we kind of hit this very sweet spot in the market and timed it very nicely, uh, where what we realized that we had tapped into was something so much more than just group messaging and reply all SMS. Uh, what we really had tapped into was the fact that people were kind of bored and disenchanted with conventional social networks. People had Twitter, which was a wonderful broadcast platform where you can send one message and it goes to the rest of the world. People had Facebook, we still have Facebook, which is a pretty saturated platform um, where there's really no common connection between you and a majority of the friends that you have. And what we had realized was that these platforms and networks made communication and self-expression pretty sterile, right? Because you couldn't say the things you wanted to say, you couldn't share the things you wanted to share, you couldn't make the jokes that you wanted to make, that you couldn't make the jokes that you wanted to make, because people were always watching and judging and everything was publicly accessible to absolutely everybody. And they actually inhibited self-expression. And what we had tapped into and what we realized immediately that we found so compelling was that Groupie was a platform that actually enabled you to be yourself because you communicate in small private groups where you know everybody else in the group. So you actually feel comfortable telling that joke, or you feel comfortable sharing that picture, or you feel comfortable making that plan or saying what you actually want to say because you have a common relationship with these people and very, very strong context. Um, and people really believe that um, because it was true. Uh, and we were able to really articulate that, and then in December of 2010, we were actually able to raise another round of financing from Postal Ventures and General Catalyst, um, and then South by Southwest came along in March of 2011. And that was really a wonderful, wonderful experience for us because um, we lined up a bunch of product there, and it's also a perfect use case if you want to talk about South by Southwest. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people talk about South by Southwest and think they can just launch their product there and something you know, magic's gonna happen, but it really, uh, it was just kind of the culmination of uh, a lot of pre South by Southwest work happening, and then a good execution on the ground at South by. But you know, basically, we were we were launching product, so we had our we had some momentum going in. We raised around financing. Uh, we released uh, you know two major updates to the to the app in the you know weeks before, and uh, it was the perfect grounds for people to really get a chance to see Ruby shine and use it for kind of our original intention of using it as a music festival. South by Southwest is the perfect thing where a bunch of people are coming together in the real in real life and in person and needed a way to stay in touch, you know, and coordinate going places. Um, so it was just kind of like 
for us, like the perfect storm of like, you know, lots of press momentum going in, lots of product momentum going in, people already downloading, knowing to download the app in advance, then getting there and then having a great experience with it. And then we kind of like, you know, um, our PR firm and us basically nailed the execution too, right? Like it was just this, like we found this awesome little burger shack across the street from uh, the event center yeah. and, and, and labeled it the Groovy Grill and gave out free grilled cheese because that's, you know, we like these bands, the band Fish we were talking about, well, hippies would sell their grilled cheese for a dollar to get to the next show and we kind of wanted to do a throwback to that. And, you know, like it, it just, we, people were happy. And we get to sit down and talk to users and like get feedback and we know what to build next and like be seen and like people were using the product around South by Southwest and they would see our logo and they'd come in and they'd chat and like it was just magical. Uh, it was like a super great experience. But you know, like you, you gotta see how many different pieces were going on there. It wasn't just like you show up to South by Southwest and you know, launch and something magic happens. So, you know, the apps that the South by Southwest is a great place for apps that make South by, that make South by Southwest better to shine, right? Like any app that makes the experience there better should do well there. Um, so yeah, there is a big difference between you know I think a way a lot of the way that people approach South by Southwest. We just use it really effectively. Okay, great. Um, wanted to 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 still go on, but the, so when you got your first seed funding, um, this was obviously like you said this was before. Your lawn, well, before South by, right? And so, how did that process happen? I mean, like, how did you, how did you get into the deal flow so someone could see you guys and say, oh, we'd like to invest you? How did that, how did that whole process happen there? Talk about Charlie. Wait, I, 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 <laughs> I was zoning out because I'm just going through my head thinking about like, you know, I, I was talking about our PR firm, and then I, you know, I kind of missed a bit about how well we are also engaging the press in a lot of the things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how to ride that, and riding that wave is so important. And I was just replaying the group messaging wars in my head of, of what happened leading up to South by Southwest and just yeah. thinking through it again, kind of internally laughing at how crazy it was. So I, I missed the question. <laughs> how, how did we raise our C round of financing? Oh, so I mean walking, like, yeah, okay. So uh, before the hackathon started, I went up to, Jared wasn't there yet, it was like right before they were like making the announcements. I like tapped to this guy I knew was an investor, uh, and, I, and I, I tapped him and I'm like, hey, my name's Steve, uh, I'm gonna solve like group communications in 24 hours. And like, it was like a stupid little comment, and like, this guy Charlie O'Donnell, that's who it was, uh, was there, and that's who I said to. And he's like, okay, yeah, great, you know, I'll like, talk to you later. And, uh, you know, it, 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 we ended up kind of doing that and then meeting with him afterwards and showing him what we did. And uh, I think that, that we, we actually took the product, we took those free tickets that we won that Jared was excited about. And um, you actually couldn't get out of work the yeah. one day. But I went and walked to the floor of uh, Disrupt and was giving demos. So a buddy of mine, two of my buddies that actually were like, hey, one of my friends I hadn't seen since high school really was like, dude, what are you doing here? I'm like, yeah, we built this app. He's like, let's go show it to people. And I'm like, okay. And uh, at one point, I remember my phone was dying. I'm giving demos to all these VCs. I have no idea who they are. Um, you know, Ron Conway, who I absolutely love, was walking through the hall the night of the hackathon, and I had no idea who he was. Um, Jared was like, oh, God, it's Ron Conway. <laughs> all right, I got to go back and it. But so I'm, I'm sitting in the hall where people had paid like thousands of dollars to kind of like, you know, pay to be on Startup Alley. And there I was, you know, with like, you know, set my laptop on one of the Startup Alley desks, I think. And uh, plugged into those guys and, and was just giving demos this line of people and getting business cards. And I walked the best jet and I'm like, yo, man, here's, here's what I met today. And I had no idea who these people were. And it's like, dude, this is real. Uh, and from there, you know, we met with Charlie. Charlie introduced us to a bunch of people. It was fantastic for us. Um, and then that, the best part about fundraising for Groupie was that you could actually put the investors into a group. So having the two of us as co-founders, even if you were talking to one other person, you could make a group of the three of you and just use the product. And uh, you know, using the product ended up being kind of like the magical way for us to go raise money because you could feel it. Yeah. And I think that's what's hard for so many people is you know, you're investing in something that you don't totally understand because you're not the target user and all that stuff. And that was just another like, kind of magical thing for group is I think we could use it. So how many people in this room actually have a prototype that they can actually show to people? You guys have? Okay. 
I, I don't know if you guys know this, but Charlie O'Donnell, I see him in most, like, a lot of New York events. You guys could do the same thing with it. I mean, you know, you, 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 you did it. I mean, no, you can. You can. And, uh, and then from Char Charlie O'Donnell, then came Ron Conway. So I actually wanted to talk a little bit about Ron Conway because I know that uh, that was basically your conduit. Is it fair to say it was your conduit to the West Coast and, and the, yeah. the whole axis there? So talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so uh, Ron is the Don, and yeah. SB Angel uh, are incredible, incredible value added investors. And what SB Angel says, so SB Angel is the firm that Ron founded and is now an advisor to. Um, and it's run by a couple guys, uh, David Lee, Kevin Carter, um, Topher Conway, um, and now Brian Corning. Uh, and they're all exceptionally good people. And what they say is that they get involved with companies at inflection points. Um, and inflection points really mean um, points where something absolutely critical is about to happen, generally kind of stimulated by high growth. Uh, and that could be an inflection point where you feel like it's time to hire somebody absolutely critical who's senior. It can be an inflection point uh, where you need to raise more capital, or it can be an inflection point where you need to sell your company. Uh, and the way they work is you ping them when you feel like you are at an inflection point, and they really, really help facilitate and make things happen. Uh, and they are wonderful connectors, uh, and they do everything. Uh, I'm a firm believer they do everything because they just believe in paying it forward. Like they are genuinely good people, and they believe that the more, and I think this really comes down from Ron, because um, Ron is a philanthropist at heart, um, and all I've ever seen Ron do is help people. Just put himself out there and volunteer to help people. Uh, and it's worked out extraordinarily well for them. Uh, and I think that the more they've paid forward, the more successful they've been. Um, so we can't say enough good things about Ron. They were wonderful at helping us put together our first round of financing, our second round of financing, okay. and they also introduced us to Skype. Um, okay, well, we're going to get to there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, another note on Ron is that like he's a West Coast investor, um, and you know, as you guys get serious about things and start raising around, and let's say it's going well, and you've got New York people in it, and like you're like, well, you should be conscious of your connection to the West Coast. Um, you know, like, I'm it's super pro New York tech, I love it here, I wouldn't live in any other city, like, this is great, but there's also some magic that happens out in the valley, there is uh, some kind of, like, insider info and knowledge about things, there's a lot of acquirers out there, there's a lot of, like, later stage funds out there, there's, having an ally on the West Coast is a really good thing to have, and Ron was that for us in a huge way. You know, as Jared was saying, with all those inflection points, without him, you know, I really don't know the grooming would not have played out how it did. It really wouldn't. Um, so be conscious of that. You know, if it's not Ron, uh, it's still worth trying to find someone on the West Coast who can be kind of an ally for you out there because there's a whole ecosystem that you want to be involved in. Um, go out there and visit it at least once a quarter while you're doing your startup um, because you know that West, the West Coast guys are, are great and you should not ignore them. A lot of the acquirers, too, are, are located there, so you want some so let me do a, let me do a little bit of connecting the dots here. So Charlie O'Donnell was your first main guy. Then how did that connection to Ron? Was it the Charlie make the introduction? Charlie, did one. Charlie introduced us to SB Angel. SB Angels. Okay, so did you guys get that? <laughs> so the thing is, is that these are very small steps. Uh, that I mean, you'll see eventually. We'll talk. We'll talk about the Skype acquisition. But I mean, that's what everyone sees, and they're like, "Wow, that was that was easier said than done." But you guys had taken these little baby steps. So let's talk about that. With um, with your Skype acquisition, so was that? I mean, group me is your baby, and um, so how did that conversation go? Uh, was this? Uh, I'm assuming that was probably coming from the investors, kind of thing. Hey, I think it might be a good idea to get bought up by Skype. I don't know. Just can you guys talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, we had no intention of you know, selling the company at that time. Um, you know, we had had previous acquisition offers uh, from other companies that we had turned down. Um, and, you know, there was no pressure whatsoever. The great thing about working with a really uh, high class level of, of investor is that they're not just looking to cash out at X number of dollars, right? They're trying to play the long game. They want to see a hugely successful company. Um, and the ones that are entrepreneur friendly will give you the freedom and flexibility for you to weigh that 
decision yourself, uh, for you to use them to talk it over, for you to get their feedback on, is this a good idea? But you know, there was no way, we were, we were raising another round of financing when we sold the company. Um, we were not pressured into an acquisition whatsoever. Um, so, you know, it, it was a very natural process. I mean, we were actually dealing with Skype first to just do a commercial partnership with them to start powering our international SMS and talking about voice and video. And, you know, it was kind of our stake to kind of align ourselves with a, with a bigger player in the space to help international growth. Um, and then, you know, the talks went so well that they led towards that path, but it wasn't even our initial goal. Good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I, I forgot to ask this one question uh, uh, at the disrupt. I'm sorry to go back. Disruptathon. The disrupt. Yeah. Disrupt. The disrupt. There is actually an event in DC called Disruptathon. That's why. So, um, when you guys were creating the uh, the product, did uh, um, did you guys did you have, actually have like folks come up to you and say, "I'd like to be on your team"? <laughs> Could have been three people there. Like, did you did you guys have any like uh, Anybody interested in joining you guys? I uh, when at the hackathon. Yeah. Yes. Um, we did. Yeah. Um, so we initially ran into an old uh, friend of mine who actually worked for me when I was in school, uh, and we said I think first we invited him to help us out um, because because we could you know we could could have used extra hands on a programmer and Steve was pretty much in the whole thing himself, yeah. um, which is pretty much what ended up happening anyways. Um, and uh, he was like, nah, man, I'm going to go do my own thing with my buddy who I brought from school as well. Uh, and then like two or three hours later, they came back because we had uh, like hibernated in this room. Uh, and he came back to the room and he was like, yeah, let's see what you're doing. And we'll help. And they ended up helping. Um, this guy named Matt Ward and another guy named Dennis Vaughn. Um, yeah. They've great. But the, the beauty of the Hack Club is that I think that does happen, right? There are people that are there without an idea. And you know, starting a company at a hackathon is not really the goal of many hackathons. Yeah. I mean, like you're going there to experiment with technology, to push yourself to build something, to have fun. And like you know, we had we had people who came in and we told them what we were doing. They're like, "That's really cool. Uh, are you going to use this technology? You use XMPP?" And we're like, "No, nah, we're going to do it this way." He's like, "Cool. I don't want to work with you, bye." You know, like people are there for having fun. So that's that's what it's about. Yeah, because how do folks in this room? Uh, and I would, I would assume that, uh, how many of you are technical here? How many of you are BD business designers? Okay, so there's an uh, eclectic group Good here. Thing. But the point is is that like every time we think of a, a hack day, it's like, oh, I'm business, I'm a designer, I don't want to, like, I'm not a hacker, I don't want to go there. But yet, you know, you guys kind of complement each other. Do you even recommend, you know, folks who are not technical to go and try to meet, you know, the, your potential co-founder? And then that's the other thing. What's what's a good technical co-founder? Well, I mean, finding a technical co-founder for someone who doesn't know one is it's your biggest challenge, right? But you've got all these ideas, you got all these ideas. Like, you know, I think one of the big things that why people don't usually fund people without a technical co-founder is like you need to be able to inspire people. You need to be able to inspire people. Like Jared inspired me. Um, you know, I. Hopefully, inspired him a bit too. We knew we wanted to work together. Like that was established way before the idea and, and, and stuff had happened. And, like you can be doing that with people in social settings. You can be doing that with people. Yes, maybe at a hackathon. Like there's all these different ways to do it. But don't think that like inspiring the person is what's important, right? Like it, you're not going to be like, hey, just let me pitch you this and think that something magic's going to happen. It's like a, it's a long process for us. Um, but you know there are some startup weekend type things where people form into teams and they go and attack problems and like they try to solve things and like I have friends who like kind of like do the hackathon circuit and like they're just like into doing hackathons and sometimes they have ideas sometimes they don't and like you know I think they're there I wouldn't say that that should be your primary way to go looking for a co-founder but on the other hand it lets you like sit around engineers and kind of like understand them a little bit more you know like understanding. The, the process, and like Jared, when, when he was first with the company, there was this big divide between programmers and the, you know, the engineers and the, the business guys. And, you know, I'd say one of the great things that I've seen is that Jared has like so well um, earned the like respect of those people that now he goes and talks to engineers like it's, he speaks the right language. There's, there's very much a level of respect, there's very much a level of just understanding that you can get by just being around engineers. And like, Hackathon's not a bad way to learn that, but it's not a silver bullet in finding a co-founder. That's a very sweet point. <laughs> That's very sweet.
Um, well, you asked about um, how to find a technical co-founder. I'm actually not best suited to answer that question. Um, I got just extraordinarily lucky, and I think the only reason we were able to do this is because Steve and I had been friends for years before we started GroupMe, and we had always wanted to work with each other and had a, a, a great mutual respect and admiration for each other. Um, so I think Steve kind of, I think that those tips are really cool. Go to a hackathon, go to different tables, ask how you can help, ask how you can just sit in and actually listen to what people are doing. I think that's phenomenal advice. Um, the other thing you can do and probably should do, uh, like Steve said, is learn how to speak code. Um, and there's a bunch of free services online. Really kind of understand sort of just the fundamentals of programming. Um, and how the web all works. And you can learn these things by using tools like Codecademy. There's a lot of literature out there. Um, Albert Wenger from Union Square Ventures has a great series of blog posts. That's literally, how does the web work? When you type in a URL into the browser, what happens? How does a page appear right in front of you? Um, and you should have a, a good grasp on what that means and how that works. Um, but then you asked um, like what you should look for in a co-founder. Um, and I think that the most important thing, aside from complementary skill sets, which I think is absolutely essential, um, because you kind of need to fit together like a puzzle piece, and the way to do that best is with comp complementary skill sets, is also to have a, a strong comfortability in having a dialogue and questioning each other's assumptions. So uh, just because Steve is technical, is in charge of product and engineering, um, and uh, it's my job to make sure that the business operates smoothly, does not mean that I can issue an ultimatum for my expertise and he can issue an ultimatum for his expertise. We constantly challenge each other, constantly make each other explain why we believe in what we believe and why we're doing what we're doing, always questioning the why behind our decisions and opinions. And it's through that dialogue that we're better able to understand why it is we're deciding to do what we're going to do and ultimately make better decisions as a joint team. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just going to give some, some credit to him that he was missing out on this. Like, before we even started working together, he had some other ideas I wasn't interested in working on. But, um, you know, we, I put him in touch, like, leveraging your friend, even if you're not ready to work together, like, I put him in touch with a consultant who did some work for him. And, like, when you have a consultant or a friend that you can say, let's work on this on the weekend, or like, let's just try something, or hey, if I pay you this, like, you can develop a report and then you learn how to teach people, or how to speak that code, if you will. You know, like, and I think that what's good about focusing on this a bit, and not just moving on to the next thing, is, is that this seems like a group of people who really want to build things, right? Like you guys want to be entrepreneurs, you guys want to, or, or, or are entrepreneurs who are on their way, and like, you know, I hate, when I tell, when we tell our story, we, we kind of leave out any kind of like functional advice, right? Like, like what, what you can actually do and take action on. So like, you know, I, I really hope that that section on, on that co-founder stuff and, and how to speak code and work on the engineering side, it, it helps because I know how hard that can be. It's like you sit around thinking you have the world in your head and you just need to get it out and find this one thing. But, you know, you can work on those skills. Okay, and so um, talking about skills, so in your past jobs before mm -hmm. Groomy, I know Steve, you were at Guilt, and uh, Jared, you were uh, number two BD guy, uh, with oh. John Maloney. John Maloney was, was the president. You know, when he was yeah. president with Tumblr. Yeah. So can you guys talk, talk a little bit about that, how your experience there and how it gave you a leg up in running Groomy? Um, I mean, I, I think the the best experience and the best thing that can help you start a startup is to actually work at a startup before, um, and particularly a good startup or a high growth startup. Uh, so John and David kind of gave me the most wonderful opportunity in the world at Tumblr, uh, where I really got to see how that company was built from the very early days, and by see how that company was built, um, they were like extraordinarily kind and brought me to board meetings and enabled me to present and gave me access to all the information in the company so that I could actually see how this company was founded, grew, how they thought about hiring, how they thought about growth, how they thought about product development, really just get exposure into all, all sort of things of business. Um, and that was really the, the perfect experience and precedent for being able to feel a little comfortable uh, to go out there and kind of do it on my own. Um, and I think you kind of had a similar experience at Gil. Yeah, I mean, getting, getting, I got into Gil while I was going 
massive growth. You know, like I think we were, it was under 100 people when I was there. And, um, you know, it basically what's so cool about guilt is we had like a really hard problem to solve for like 20 minutes a day. But it was like a super hard problem, like when the sales would start at 12 o'clock. And like, what's great about having like one super hard problem to solve is that you like get a pretty deep layer uh, of skills to like apply to other, like, Websites that are dealing with like normal stuff all the time, I would have never seen what I saw at 12 o'clock every day at Guild, right? Like, you had to know such advanced scaling tactics to hit, yes, it wasn't to handle all day, but to even survive for that 20 minutes when sales would start, you needed like the, the advanced skills that, you know, huge, huge sites would need. So, so like, I got to learn so much about scaling, and I forget that I learned that much sometimes, and like, cause you don't get to, I never even got to a chance to apply that again until like years of group me, you know, like, so, um, you know, like, it, it, I very much believe that you need to always be learning, you know, I think that's pretty obvious advice, but I went through cycles, I think, of learning and executing, where I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go out on my own. So I did another startup before I was at Guilt, it was called Simpact, uh, it was dynamic images for email marketing, uh, I learned a lot from it, had some wins, but it wasn't a successful thing and didn't exit, I eventually shut it down. Um, but uh, I went through a period first when I got out of school of learning uh, well, my first job, then executing at my startup, and you learn a whole bit from other things, but you, I wasn't ready to be out on my own again. Because when I failed, I said, what do I have to do now? I need to go learn. I need to go be part of a team. Um, and like this is the advice I think some entrepreneurs are like, yeah, I'm just gonna go out of school and I'm gonna jump right into to starting my own business, and you know that's hard because um, you need to build a network. Like honestly, like how long did we go until we hired someone from a resume group? I mean, like um, seventeen. We hired years. one person from a resume before the Skype acquisition, I think. One, yeah, one, like, wow. one maybe <laughs> two. Like this, and where did this all come from? It came from the people we had worked with before and the people they knew. Um, so, you know, so my one year with Guild Group was probably the best thing I could have ever done, right? Like, because, like, I worked with people who seriously cared about their, their craft, uh, worked on excelling at that, and uh, were ready to, to go out and do their own thing. And, and, you know, when one person joins, they have a great network, they trust you. Uh, I very much believe that working in, in, in your field and, and gaining the respect of your peers there uh, is the ultimate way to then eventually go do a startup. <laughs> um, because that network, one person and, and, and all those hires, I mean, it's incredible. So two, two of the first three people that we worked with, that we hired, came directly from Steve and his experience working at Guild 2. Um, so building a network is absolutely one of the most important things. Yeah, that having that network and being able to tell people, especially the like engineers, like, uh, so, you know, in a lot of cases, people aren't happy at their jobs and they want to go do it their own way. You, in, in programming land, you inherit a lot of legacy code, code that someone else wrote, and you're like complaining about it or whatever. Being able to sell the vision that, like, this is our ship, we're going to do this from the ground up, there's no one to blame but ourselves, and like just kind of like pitching that on top of, we've got this great product, we've got this great thing going, we're risk, like, that was a huge selling point. And if you know that that's what people care about, um, you know, you can rally people. As I said, inspiring you know, is, is pretty much everything you need to do as a founder uh, to, to get going, so. Okay, I want to go to the um, acquisition and company culture. So talk to that. So one of, the, one of, uh, one of our um, members had wanted to ask this question about GroupMe. Are you guys a Microsoft-owned company or a Skype-owned company? Um, we are a Microsoft and Skype owned company. Uh, I guess quite literally. Okay. Well, there you I, mean, go. I, I think that because if I, I guess the meaning behind that is the whole company culture. Yeah. Uh, how do you reconcile the differences? You know, yeah. Ruby had sort of, you know, a di much different culture than Skype, and Skype had a much different culture than Microsoft. So, how did you guys reconcile that difference? Yeah, I mean, so look, we went in originally having only met anyone at Skype. Um, Maybe we met chat actually, but like mostly yeah. it was just Skype, and we had a plan with Skype uh, of what we were going to do, and you know things changed quickly, you know, with the Microsoft acquisition, and you know, but basically the good thing is they knew that if they just tried to bring us into the, their way of doing things, it wasn't going to go very well. I mean, like 
Uh, so what, what ended up doing is they gave us a good amount of separation from the way things get done in there to maintain our company culture because they absolutely love our company culture, right? Like they see how fast we move, seeing uh, a lot of our strategies for working with brands, doing the things that we do, like they did not want to lose that because if they lost that, then the whole thing would have been a waste, right? Like, like you just, grooming needs to be grooming. And they've done a great job of letting us do that. Uh, they really have. Um, you know, I think that part of it is there's, you know, a, a lot of distance between us being here in New York, but they really have let us grow. Our, you know, we continue to grow as a team, we continue to grow as a, uh, as, as a product, and the learnings that have come out of group me uh, have been extremely beneficial to Skype. Yeah. It's, been, it's been a great process. Yeah, they've been, they've been great to us. Okay. Um, we've been able, we pretty much doubled the size of the team since the acquisition. Um, you know, we have like 11x our user base, and we still have the group me swagger. It's still a wonderful yeah. place to work. Yeah. So now that we're on this topic, um, Jared, what's your opinion about the Tumblr acquisition of Yahoo, since you're from there? Uh, I think it's a good thing for New York City. I think it's a good thing for Yahoo. I think it's ultimately a good thing for Tumblr. Um, good all around. <laughs> Thumbs up. I'm being very politically correct. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that uh, is that also going to help New York City um, possibly you doing more angel investing in this area? <laughs> um, I, I actually didn't hold any uh, Tumblr stock. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I started as a consultant for, sure. I was there for a little over a year, but was a consultant for the first three months before I was converted to a full-time employee. Okay. Um, but I, I still think it's a really wonderful thing. Um, again, uh, tremendous respect for John and David. Um, I think David is uh, exceptionally good when it comes to product development. Uh, and he really nurtured and fostered Tumblr as his baby and built it into something incredible. Um, yeah, and I still think that Tumblr can be one of, it already is one of the pillars of the internet, but will continue to grow and be one of the defining pillars of the internet. Uh, and it'd be really nice to see a lot of people who have had a good experience at Tumblr go on and start other companies and help other companies grow, and it'll be really exciting to watch. So what are what is some of the, the future strategy for GroupMe? Uh, Scott, can you talk a little more about that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've always cared about a couple things, and like you know, group communications and, and solving the problems that groups have, um, you know, is kind of the primary focus of group. And you know, we recently launched a bill splitting feature. Uh, we think about this space a lot. And, like, what do groups need? What are they? Um, they, the problems that they face, and the app is in a good place now to continue to build on that. So, you know, we really differentiate ourselves from the kind of traditional one-on-one -on -one messengers and the fact that, you know, we really say this is for groups, it's in the name, you know, we name your group, you add your people, and we try to solve those group problems. So, you know, I continue to push on that, and the more we understand uh, the types of groups that form, the more we can attack those problems. And, uh, and continue to offer some uh, the right tools to make groups better. So. Okay, so um, I know that you guys. I have one more question before we'll, we'll open up to Q and A. But um, I know that you guys got kind of given back to the startup community, doing some sort of uh, angel investing yourself. I mean, I know Groupie has been sort of quiet the last year, but you guys have been pretty active on the uh, angel investing side. Do you guys care to comment on that? I mean, I mean, you guys have had some really interesting um, investments uh, according to your uh, angel list public profile. <laughs> um, Code Academy, TransferWire, Flatiron, Health, Smart Things. I've heard some really good things about Smart Thing and Sweet Green. So, and, and you guys seem like you would you guys uh, you invest in tandem. So, can you yes. guys talk about that? So, I, I would dispel um, what you said about Groupie being relatively quiet for the past year. Um, I, I think Groupie has done exceptionally well over the course of the past year. Um, we've had really exciting product releases. We've grown a lot. Um, you know, we're at 11 million total users, 3.5 million monthly active, sending over 3 billion messages a month. Like, it is very real, and all of those users are in the U.S. You need, and you need to update your Wikipedia. It's, <laughs> it's all right. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, uh, and all those users are, the, are in the U.S., which is very rare for any consumer-facing mobile application. Generally, there's around a 50-50 split between U.S. and international. Um, so we're very proud of that and very, very proud of the growth. Um, so I think Ruby's been loud 
Okay, yeah. sure, sure. Um, fair enough, fair enough. But uh, Steve and I have also uh, been fortunate enough to have the privilege of working with um, other uh, New York City entrepreneurs, not just New York City entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs from all over the globe, people that we have tremendous respect for. Um, and we have uh, set up a, a, a fun, well, pretty much a, a, an LLC where Steve and I co-invest together. Uh, and we just kind of, you know, we look for really cool opportunities where we have the privilege of working with entrepreneurs that uh, we think that we could be helpful to. Uh, and we've been lucky enough to work with some of uh, the entrepreneurs that we respect the most. Yeah, I was going to say, and the, the loud thing too, the college campus usage is so awesome in the United yeah. States. But like, we don't, you know, it's funny, like you can say something like Ruby hasn't been, uh, you know, you haven't heard much. It's because like, you know, the tech press is like, what, it's like how you guys think, and how we all kind of measure how things are going. Um, but be careful of that, right? Like there's very good reasons to not, uh, you know, go right out of the gate and say, I need a ton of press. I mean, you use, you can use press very well to do some great things. Uh, and I think the, the beauty of working with such a great firm like Group PR, I'm just giving a shout out to students in the back over there, uh, is that they know how to do that really well. But like you guys, like folks on your product, they don't even tell you, your product wins everything, you know? Like that's what matters. And like for us, you know, tech press doesn't do anything at this point, right? Like with word of mouth and building a great product does that. Yes, we use it to give reminders and like re-spark some things so people come back into it, but like word of mouth and your great products, number one. Like, just make sure you focus on that. Don't think that you're going to get some magic launch article that is going to change your business and be the, the catalyst. Because it's going to be a really disappointing day on that second day when, you know, that thousand users that clicked over from TechCrunch are just gone. You know, they, 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 don't count on that. You know, like, use the press to ride the momentum, to get the story out, to do things. But it is your product first. Um, so that was the other point. And then on the angel investing side, we're super happy with the investments we've been able to make. Uh, a lot of that happens to come from being pretty visible uh, founders uh, and you know our connections to the New York City scene, we loved giving back to it. Uh, I, I couldn't be happier, my whole apartment is decked out, smart things, like, yeah. it's great. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's the thing, we love, we love doing it. It's not a primary thing for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not like you know, super active, we're not investors. Um, we just do things when they're right. So. Okay, so we're going to open up the floor for questions. Uh, anybody have any questions? Okay, here we go. So you can say your name and uh, uh, your question. Uh, hi, I'm Ashish. Um, I just wanted to ask you actually, it's related to the last point that you guys were talking about uh, in terms of the PR and in terms of the press that you got both, uh, you know, at the TechCrunch uh, Disruptive Thought and uh, also in the <laughs> South by Southwest. Um, I just wanted to ask you, how critical do you think that was in terms of achieving your initial growth? How did it got that? How do you think things would have been different? I was just gonna say back to the point I was making on the before. The the momentum was extremely important, right? Like, and the visibility and the tech press is very useful for raising money, selling your company, things like that, hiring. Uh, there's some really good things about the tech press that's good that might not be users that I don't want to unvalue in the lower value of it. Uh, but like, there, it is important for those types of things. It's just like from a user perspective, um, you know, it might, but the momentum was really important, right? Like, press was a big piece of our momentum, uh, which like, if you think if you think back to the group you ride, it just feels like a wave, right? Like, it was just like, like, it was crazy to, you think back in the days where it was like stressful to think about, so you're like, wow, I, I remember that day. Um, there's a couple, of, I wonder if the same one popped into his mind, but, um, but like, you know, like, like it, so it was super powerful for us to be able to use it to make that wave and bigger and amplify our message and get it out there. Um, so I think it's a huge piece of the momentum of our story. It played a very big role, but like we also got super lucky on timing. Like the world was at this point where it needed this product. Like their group messaging, you know, and the iPhone and the Androids, this wasn't even there, right? You couldn't do this, right? You know, like people had tried this years before, and another company, Twilio, who we ended up using building our API on, happened to have just been out and been at this hackathon that we're at. Like so like timing, um, you know, there's so much that we that 
when it all comes together, it leads to that just crazy wave. Uh, and, and Russ helped us ride that. So. Sure. Um, I also think these things are very situational. So for us, it helped tremendously. Uh, and the reason for that was there was this thing going on at the time that was like dubbed the group messaging wars by every single tech blog out there. And uh, we were literally getting attacked from the bottom. So there are other startups who are quite deliberately copying pretty much everything about GroupMe and building their own applications doing that. And we were getting attacked from the top. So we saw Facebook under the space, Google under the space, you know, Skype was even in the space. Um, and being able to actually have an outlet to tell our story about why we were doing what we were doing right. was really critical during that time. And we were very tactical about um, like what we would do in the press. Like we would never ever mention a competitor's name in the press, um, which is something that we, we did very consciously. Um, whereas everybody else out there, um, whenever they would talk to the press, would be like, oh yeah, group me, we're better than those guys. But every time they said group me in the press, and every single time that went in print or was on video, there was our name again, exposed to more people. Um, so it was, <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, for us, it, 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 it helped a ton. Yeah. All right, next question. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the structure of Skype. I know, for example, I think they were developed in Iceland or something. So, yeah. Then there was a whole question about that the apps or the development part of it kind of, you know, was out of the picture for a while. Then it came back to the app directory. Just wondering, for example, who you spoke to. Were you speaking to what kind of group at Skype were you involved with in, in being acquired? Uh, so Skype uh, it was Estonia. Um, there are no offices in Iceland, but it's truly a, a global company. They have offices in Stockholm, Estonia, Singapore, London, Palo Alto, now Redmond, literally all over the world. Um, so that's one of the things that's really neat about it. Uh, in terms of who we talked to when we were doing the acquisition, we, uh, we literally talked to everybody. Um, uh, we talked to, initially started off talking to the head of corporate development and strategy, and then worked our way talking to various product managers, the head of uh, product, head of marketing, and then Tony Bates, the CEO. Um, so, all of them. It's crazy how global Skype is too, right? Like, it's one thing, so we had to travel a lot um, in the early days of the acquisition to all these different offices, and there was nothing better, I think you wrote a blog post about this at some point. Um, when you came back through customs and you told people who you work for, and you said Skype, they, they would just like smile. Every time. Every time. They're like, man, I used that to stay in touch with so-and-so. They have some kind of story about it. Um, you know, and that's part of like it, it, messaging and all this. We fit very nicely into like the things that Skype still needs to work on. Um, they are such a brand, a strong brand in the global in, in video, um, and there's so many more components now on mobile and everything that it's just it was a great fit for us. Okay, uh, I think we have time for one one last question. So, uh, <laughs> uh, well, most people raise their hand. How many business cards do you collect? Most business cards. How many business cards do you collect? Do you look at no? help? <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Thank you so much. So, can I ask two questions or just one? Uh, one and a half. Just go for it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, first one is um, could you please uh, just share a little bit of uh, team building? Uh, you know, the key takeaways, mistake, what would you have done differently? Since especially you have you know, the uh, transaction from being uh, started up into emerge uh, with the big corporation. The second thing is now I know you guys have talked about the angel investment you, you did in New York and it's very uh, you were happy about the result. How do you require your portfolio company to keep you updated on their progress? What are the key elements, metrics you're looking to? Thank you. Steve would probably agree, yep. is uh, learning when to trust other people to do work, and they can do that work better than you can. Uh, and as for portfolio companies, we don't require them to do anything. I think generally it's good practice to send investor updates once every six to eight weeks um, with what's going well, what's not going well, with where you need help, uh, and that's about it. The one thing we talk about sometimes when it comes to hiring, too, is if you don't know the person, 
um, or haven't worked with them before, uh, try, we use trial periods a lot. Uh, we're basically, you know, we'll hire people if they don't have a job right now as a consultant, or we'll have them work at night, night or weekend with us. But basically, I, I think that hands-on work with someone is the most important part in getting to know both sides uh, if this is a good fit. Um, I think we've done that with just about everyone. Sometimes they don't work. You have to get good at saying, sorry, this isn't the right thing, uh, which is good prep to eventually happen to do firing someday. Um, but, you know, that's the thing. It's like finding that right fit. You know, it's, it's a real, you want that bar to be really high. Firing is, is, is expensive. Um, but, you know, testing out when you can is, if they're passionate, if you're in a startup and you can't get someone to work at night and weekend for you to see if they're, this is the right thing for them, they're, they're probably not the right thing for your early stage startup. So. One more question? Or? Yeah, sure. One more question. Okay. Hi, uh, you both mentioned working at, at startups fairly early on. Um, how did you sort of cultivate that connection? With, it's the thing I was thinking about eat. Uh, Tumblr employee? Is that just through building your network and how do you uh, determine that early on in the start that this is going to be something uh, it's worth uh, working for uh, and that you're going to be able to learn something from it? Um, mine was serendipitous and a little bit of dumb luck. Uh, so my old neighbor when I used to live in New Jersey, his like uncle twice removed was John Maloney who was the president of Tumblr. And they were at a family function, and uh, I was running a, a publication called Inside New York at the time, and my old neighbor told his uncle about it. And he said, oh, that sounds neat, connect me with a kid, because I'm looking to hire somebody to help me out. And we got connected, and that was that. And then Steve kind of pushed me over the edge and convinced me to go work at Tumblr. On the guilt side, I was actually pretty lucky. I, uh, my startup was failing. I had had to move out of my apartment, find a studio apartment. Uh, I was in really bad shape. <laughs> Uh, and they got an email from a recruiter being like, hey, come work at Guild. I'm like, wait a second, this is awesome. <laughs> I went in and like, you want to pay me how much? <laughs> oh, okay, and Guild was also, the reason I really wanted to do it is Guild was one of the people I wanted to be customers of my startup. Um, just because they did, we were doing dead end email and yeah, they were good for their real time sales and things like that. So I actually was internally always trying to sell the company as well to Guild. So it was kind of an ulterior motive the whole time. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was once we got there, we knew uh, it was a, an incredible environment, a great learning experience. So like, yeah. So talk to people about who, who work at these things if you're interested. Like, you know, get the feedback of other people who are there if you can find them. One, one more question. Okay, thank you. Um, we started recently a company. We have patents. We have product. And my question is, when, when should we start to raise uh, the capital? Uh, sh should we start uh, to raise, uh, should we access directly VCs, or should we start with the angel? When we have already product available, when we started to interact with the customers, but unfortunately we did not sign up any customer. Uh, there's no magic time of when to raise money. I mean, if you look at someone like GitHub who waited years and years and years to raise money and then raises $100 million, you know, like, that, that was years of them just doing it themselves, right? So like, I think that the question is, when do you need money? And what story are you telling that is gonna get an investor to be like, wow, this is an opportunity that I can't miss. This is a huge market, and this is the, because in the first stage where we're raising money, they're really betting in you as a team, uh, and how big the idea is are the two main factors that are going on. Can this be something huge, and is this a team that can do it? But the idea that we have so unique that investors are not familiar with us. And uh, when, we, when we approach investors, they just don't want to spend time to study this new segment of the market because it's so disruptive technology. So they just, uh, we are not able. So the question is, uh, should we should we just continue to pursue a group for the investors? I, I mean, could you need it? If, you, if it's an option, we, we, if it's a choice, you're, the way you're, you're describing is like, when is the time? It sounds like it's a choice. So if that's the case, I would keep doing it. Now look, the, what I would do, if it's not a choice, and you need to raise money, you want to find people who are experts in your field who have been successful, and like would understand the concept, and that maybe have had successful like, you know, exits in their life, or have done something big, that wouldn't spend the time. You need to find some champions. And then if you find one or two champions who are really like aware of it, and can be the proxy to a VC, that's like, look, 
I get this. And they're trusted in the VC's network. Some VC firms actually have some really smart people who work for them as operators, uh, who work for them to vet these things. I know the Coastalists have uh, an extremely intelligent network behind them in terms of how they vet their wild ideas. And the other kind of guys who invest in like, you know, fake meat companies and like crazy things. So there are VCs out there savvy enough to figure this out. Uh, finding the champion may be difficult, but if you find one champion who, who is trusted in those networks, they can walk you to the right people to, to, get, that, to get that out there. Okay, we can always, we can always do that off, offline. But, uh, so one of the final question, and I know we didn't put this in the <laughs> list of questions we sent you guys. We always, send, we always ask this question at the end for all of our guests. You can take your turns, but who's your favorite superhero and why? Or historical, uh, historical person. So. Oh, I talk to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> we go first. People are gonna think I'm weird. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that Elon Musk is like a superhero. Okay. Right? Like, <laughs> I think this guy is just. Well, I mean, he's like he is. A, okay, Tony Stark. Right yeah. Because like, <laughs> like, I just love that there is someone who's floating between the the like land of like being a real human being and superhero. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so I, for right now, I mean, off the top of my head, uh, you know, he's just doing some really cool stuff. So. My wife is my favorite superhero. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jared and Steve. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.